Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sweeney Show, Business and All podcast. And joining me here today is Keith Walsh, a solicitor, a award-winning family law advocate. Uh, Keith, you're very welcome. Thanks, David. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, so, the, obviously, the courts have, in the last couple of months, have changed. And with family law have been one of the essential services and a, a critical service in the legal industry. How, how have you been getting on the last couple of months? And what changes have you noticed? Well, it's been very different, really. Um, I, I suppose the, the, the main change has been kind of the absence of courts uh, being able to progress cases and people have been stuck in cases. So cases that we thought were being finished aren't, aren't being finished. Um, and there's no great progression in Dublin, unfortunately, with the case progression, which most cases are. Um, then you have very acute cases like domestic violence, where um, access to the court is essential. That has continued. And again, domestic violence is primarily done through the district court. So the District Court, I think, has played a blinder in terms of family law. It's, it's really been fantastic on the daily as the president has come out with some really sensible and practical guidance for maintenance enforcement for domestic violence uh, and for access to, during COVID-19. So I, I think on, on that level, it's, it, it's been helpful in the District Court. The Circuit Court, I, I think, has been slightly less helpful, but it's more difficult. But they've pioneered remote consent divorces, which is it's hugely helpful. The High Court, which is primarily in Dublin for family law, is run by judge. Uh, by um, uh, sorry, the, the High Court judge, yeah. say what I forgot there. But he he um, he's been very helpful also in moving the the High Court list. So all of the lists are moving apart from the Circuit Court. But I'm hopeful tomorrow, which is the tenth, that the Circuit Family Court uh, in Dublin, in particular, will will start to move again. But um, I suppose one of the other features of it has been the great response from the Family Lawyers Association, the DSBA, the Law Society and family lawyers around the country, um, both by way of uh, Justin Spain has, has created a WhatsApp and also the associations themselves have produced guidelines to assist practitioners and clients during COVID-19 and, and have come out with some really helpful stuff mm -hmm. on maintenance, enforcement, on access during covid and uh, on domestic violence issues. And also the Gordi, I think, have, have released a number of statements in terms of, I think, as, as recently as yesterday, we're talking about enforcement of um, uh, of domestic violence matters during uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. which hasn't been a feature of the Gordi to date, and which I suppose comes from the new Domestic Violence Act, which came into effect uh, the January before last. So w there's, while it's it's been, difficult. And I, I think the response of the various stakeholders has been really uh, astonishing in some ways, but also kind of um, very helpful to people caught in this situation. Um, so I, I suppose slightly negative, but huge positive response. So yeah. there's a lot of good things. Yeah. Where I, think. And I saw you actually sat on the Law Society Committee yourself and you participated and contributed to it. Um, and do you know what, we'll get, we'll get into the specifics of the family law and the, the things that have cropped up. Just can I take you back there? Because a lot of people are interested and we have a lot of uh, new solicitors and people into law. What's your own legal journey? Did you, do you have a law undergraduate or is, is the legal uh, fraternity in your family? Uh, no, it's, it's not really. Um, I did a BCom in UCG uh, with the intention of doing the LLB, which was a post-grad uh, there at the time, and you do all your kind of legal subjects. I mean, some of them as part of the BCom, and then you do the LLB. Um, uh, so I went to UCG. I'm from Mayo, from Ballandro, which is a town in between the lakes. And all my family, my dad and my, my granny actually went to UCG as well, and my brother and sister. So uh, so it's a great spot, and Galway is a fantastic place to, to train and to to do your BCom and then the LLB and I did a year in France on the way as well. But um, it's a big jump, I suppose, from Galway to Dublin and I couldn't really figure out how, how do you kind of move from the west of Ireland to get a job in Dublin because I wanted to, I suppose, and uh, that took me a while by London. I did it, worked over there in, in recruitment and teaching for a while and came back to Dublin and eventually I found my way into the Legal Aid Board, which is the connection with the uh, family law. I answered an ad for a law clerk um, but that was, I think, about 98. But at that point, it was probably the best time ever to get any kind of job in law or in anything because the economy was just about to heat up. And I'd looked in 94, 95 for traineeships and for work in law. And there was, I mean, it was a kind of scorched earth at that stage, really, until, until 97. But in 98, it was... I mean, it was, it was all the most difficult not to get an apprenticeship or a job. So I, I was just very fortunate in that I gave it a kind of a second go, although I was never going to do anything else. But, um, uh, you know, so I, I think it was fortunate. But once I got into the Legal Aid Board, I got great experience doing family law. And I also got enough experience to, to realise 
I, I'm not a public servant by, by nature and that there's great work done on the Legal Aid Board and they offered me traineeship, but I wanted to do a kind of a wider uh, look at it. And I, I suppose if there is any younger solicitor looking or thinking about their career, I really would avoid, if you can, specialising. I mean, I did family law, I liked it, but I thought I needed to do probate, conveyancing, mm. different types of, of litigation. I actually then wanted to do employment law. I, I got a job that combined employment law and family law, of which there aren't that many, particularly when you're looking. But again, I, I was lucky. I, I did my training with Anthony Harris, who the general practice was very interested in litigation. So we, I did an awful lot of litigation, a bit of conveyance and probate. But then I wanted to kind of specialise because I always thought, well, maybe employment law and, and look for that. And then got a job doing employment law uh, with Carl Fawcett, who's a great sister since retired. And she did a lot of the um, a lot of trade union work. So that's great employment law um, work. Did that, but realised, actually, I, I think I prefer either the general litigation or uh, family. The employment is great, but there's a huge amount of kind of... Um, just advices and stuff where you're you're getting quite specific and a lot of kind of smaller things as well as court cases. And I suppose one of the attractions of being a solicitor is you get out to the office, uh, whether you're a litigator or in family law, one of the disadvantages, the, the older you get, is you're out of the office a huge amount because mm. you're in court and you actually need an awful lot of time in the office to get through the files. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I suppose I, my, my main, I, I suppose, lesson that I learned is if you, you're doing something that you don't like, change it, mm. don't keep doing it. Mm. And, and, and that's, I suppose, the way I operated my career without any great plan. But just when I was doing something, I thought, I'm not mad about this. Why don't you try something else? Um, and then you find your niche. And I, I think specialisation is essential at the mm. minute. Oh. And I suppose I, you know. When did you um, then strike out on your own? What, what spurred that decision? Set up um, your own firm? I, uh, well, I was in, I did my apprenticeship with Anthony Harris. I started in 99 and finished in 2001. Then I worked with him for another year and moved to the, the firm in town that did employment law and family. And then I, I worked with another firm. And then in 2004, Anthony was looking kind of to retire. So I, I was talking to him and he said, why don't you come back? I'm, I'm going to kind of go to semi-retirement and you run the practice and we'll see how it goes. So we did that for three years and then he, he, he completely retired and I just took over. So from that point of view, I'd known the practice because I trained there um, I knew the area and I knew that he had, he had a particular interest in particular types of kind of, I suppose, what I call heavy duty litigation, which um, I maybe wasn't quite as interested. I was more interested in the general practice and the family. But um, that was a great way to do it because you didn't have to set up on your own. There was an established practice. I, I did buy in, so I had to give him a few quid and do it that way. But um, I suppose it was a good time to be doing that. 2004, things were just getting busy. Um, and then when he retired in 2007, it was kind of about to, to change completely. And um, and that's what happened. But um, it's certainly I wouldn't regret it for a day. I think it's been great. I, I'm one of those people who like to work for themselves as well. Mm, and that's the, how do you separate then kind of the solicitor mindset to the business owner mindset? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, and I'm kind of signed there, I suppose, uh, with it, but it's, it's, it's hugely different. Um, uh, it, you know, if there's 10 people working in our office and it's, you know, even uh, the, the smallest thing requires a bit of routine and organization and you can save yourself so much time by, by, by organizing things better. Um, we've used case management system for about 10 years. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I, I, I think uh, the difficulty when you're a kind of a, uh, somebody who works in the practice that you, you kind of become more interested in the legal work to the detriment of the business side. And I think that's always a, a struggle to say, look, it's it, I, what's the point in continuing to do the legal work if you're not properly organized and, mm -hmm. and your office isn't set up right? So I think it's a constant uh, battle between the two elements and um, but there's an awful lot more, certainly in the last 10 years, there's been a great upsurge in information and training and people talking about the business of running a, a, a legal practice where, where that wasn't really there. There's maybe Adam Neary and David Rowe in, 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 you know, from 2005 on. And then post the kind of crash, you had a huge interest in, I think, risk management rather than practice management. And then it kind of flipped over. And you have a huge amount of people will say on the law society and practice management and um, the 
um, guidance and ethics and, and various committees who are interested in the TSPA are great at their seminars. So um, so there's a lot out there. And I, I did a course at the IMI as well, which was really helpful. And I have a BCom, but I mean, I suppose I went into the law not to do the business stuff. So I thought, well, if I, if I wanted to, to do the business stuff, I would have been an accountant or something with a BCom or done marketing. So I, I deliberately stayed away from the commercial law side of yeah. things. Um, so I suppose it's... You know, courses for courses. Mm. So, and just I'd like to talk to you about family law. Um, a couple of aspects with it today, just in particular to divorce. Uh, obviously, divorce in Ireland is only here uh, since ninety five, ninety six, and when the legislation brought in. Where, where exactly is the divorce in Ireland now? How easy is it to get divorced? What timelines are involved? What's involved? It's much easier than it was to get divorced. Um, we had the referendum last May, which I, I was very involved in campaigning with Jesse from Madigan, and we, we organised lawyers for yes with Muriel Walls, Peter Ward, and Flack, and a variety of other people. Um, and so, um, thanks mainly to Jesse from Madigan, the, the waiting time for divorce was reduced from five years to two years. And um, But the law, the, the constitution changed in May, but the actual law uh, to change it only was passed in December. But that law did a couple of very important things. In addition to reducing the waiting time for divorce or introduce it to the statute book, it also removed a part from uh, from the law. So you don't have to be living separate and apart for two years. You just have to be living separately. Uh, so that meant that you could still be living under the same roof. You just weren't living intimately under the same roof. Now, up until now, the separate and apart was a little bit more of a problem. So I, I, I think what, what actually happened with the referendum that people don't always realise is that um, the whole waiting time for divorce was removed completely from the constitution. So it's now the legislature can reduce that again if they want. Now, I think they're unlikely to for a couple of years, but it may be reduced. Two years is a long time um, and it may reduce to one year, but I, I, that's going to be enough. So okay. right, but at the minute, it's two years. <laughs> Previously, you had to live apart four out of the previous five years, wasn't that it? Oh, it's, yeah, it's two out of the previous three. And you had to live separate and apart, whereas now you only have to live separately. And separate separately is defined as not living in a committed and intimate relationship. And that came from the cohabitation legislation. Uh, that's that phraseology, um, which was introduced uh, about 10 years ago. So it's the, if you like, the bar has dropped considerably in terms of living separately. But two years is still a very long time, particularly if you're uh, younger and you want to remarry or you want to have children and you want to, you know, you know, I think there's an argument to say, look, two years is a long time, but it is no fault, mm. which means that you don't get involved in the mudslinging. There's, there's no fault. Whereas you can still get judicially or legally separated if even in, in a court, if you're not living together uh, um, for any period, because for adultery or where the other partner has behaved unreasonably. Um, or in such a way that you couldn't be expected to continue to live together, then you can apply straight away to the court. And that's important if you want to get reliefs. So if you want to, for example, get a freezing order, if someone's moving money, you need to get into court quickly. So legal separation isn't going to go away. You still always have that kind of safety valve to the court, which you need, because the two years is probably a little bit too long. And among the many items that would be negotiated in a divorce settlement or divorce agreement or separation agreement, it would be access, maintenance and the pension. Maybe if we could just discuss a bit on those in those three headings. Uh, where does, uh, I suppose, spousal and child maintenance come into a negotiation? Well, it's front and centre. And I suppose any negotiation is a kind of, it's a, it's a movable feast in that you have a number of variables like the ones that you've mentioned and if one of them goes up the other might go down so it's it's kind of when you're negotiating it it's a it's a kind of it's a package or a suite rather than just one one item but in in terms of spousal maintenance really you're looking at a dependent spouse um uh, most uh, wise but not all are working outside the home the ones who aren't working outside the home will probably be in a position to get spousal maintenance depending on the ability of the husband but it's not a guarantee, but it, it doesn't come up in an awful lot of your, your normal straightforward cases. It tends to come up in the uh, big money cases quite a bit, uh, because you'll have a husband who may have the wife technically on the payroll for tax reasons, but in actual fact, the wife is, is dependent. And again, um, the, the more advanced in years the wife is, the less likely she is 
to be to return to the workforce. And um, remember, we still have the constitution of provision, which says that a wife's work in the home should be treated equally to husband's work outside the home. But that's also important, not just for maintenance, but for pension, that because a spouse hasn't had the opportunity or maybe has had a time off to have children or raise children, whatever, she's lost out in pension entitlement. So a court will be very, very quick to remedy any difference. So what we're seeing now is this new pension thing called pension equalisation, which is that you add up whatever pension the, the wife has, whatever the husband has, and an actually then divides them down the middle. So it's not like you're getting half your husband's pension, you'll get half whatever the total of the pensions is, and, and there may be a kind of a, a reckoning at that stage. Um, so it's very important that people are put into the, into the position that they need to be in. But I suppose the overall concept to remember in, in family law is proper provision. We're different to England or to America, which are more contribution-based, or what you put in, you take out. We're, that's not us at all. We're based on provision, which is more or less based on need. And it's that people at the end of the process of separation or divorce have to be properly provided for and so do the children. What's proper provision? It's accommodation. It's enough money to live. It's a proper pension. And so so it, it's, a, it's a different mindset. And people, I suppose, come into it thinking, well, I only put 20000 into the house 10 years ago. I'm sure I'm not really entitled to that much. And he's paid the mortgage. I think you have to put all of those um, factors into the mix. But it, it when they come out, it, it could be slightly different. We have a kind of a joint enterprise approach to marriage. We're not joint property like they have in some states in America, but we're joint enterprise. And look, you were doing this together. You were running it as a unit. You both put your best into it. And so it's very important that you, you get what you can out of it. So from that point of view, and because the, the courts are behind closed doors or in camera, people often don't realize their rights. And they come to you, and I, I'm always surprised. And it, it happens almost daily that you tell people their rights are and they're surprised and they're either happily surprised or not so happily surprised to learn well look at actual fact this is the likely outcome and um i suppose we as, as family lawyers what you do is you tell the the, the, the client what a court might do because that's your kind of um that's your um benchmark and you say well this is what a court might do um and there's a range that i think most family lawyers would give to their clients and say look this is the range that you're in this is a good deal, this is an okay deal, and this isn't a great deal, you know. And how is child access and all that t taken into account or considered and agreed upon? Well, child access, um, uh, prim primarily in Ireland, you, if, you're a, uh, if you're a marital parent, you're going to get joint custody. But joint custody doesn't mean that both people have the child or children 50-50. Um, in Australia, a number of years ago, they passed a law that automatically, um, or there was a, not necessarily law, but a, a kind of direction that um, uh, access would be uh, split down the middle. And that hasn't worked out so well where there's been a, a division because they, they found it was more parent-centred. That This was what the parents wanted. They wanted to split the, the access or the, the custody right down the middle. And that actually what the children wanted was one base where they went from school every day, where that was their home, rather than have had half their clothes and half their stuff in each house. So I think in Ireland, we're more traditional. We never got to 50-50, really. Uh, you have some, and I've had some cases where the father has the, the children 50% and the mother has the child 50% of the time, but that's generally not imposed. That's something that's evolved organically for particular sets of circumstances. In most cases, what happens in Ireland is the mother would have the children for four or five days a week and the father would have them maybe every second weekend and maybe a couple of overnights or something like that so that generally is the typical one but it depends again one of the most important things particularly in dublin or bigger cities is proximity the closer the parents can can remain together the more likely that there'll be a lot more access that it'll also be more fluid and be more flexible and again the older the children they're going to go with their feet the younger they are the more care they need so it it all depends, and again, this is the problem, I suppose, every single case is slightly different, but generally, there would be very generous access, but it won't probably reach the 50-50 the mm -hmm. uh, level, because the court would probably view that as more uh, parent-centred rather than the child-centred. Can I just go back there to the division of assets uh, question there in a divorce agreement? In, in America, you, you heard, you know, the prenup or the prenuptial agreement, and it, you can't have one in Ireland, but it doesn't seem to have any kind of base in law or can be changed. Do you think that's something that might come in or do you think there's a benefit for having an agreement before animals enter into marriage? 
Yeah, well, I, I, I did a number of talks on this about five years ago, and I googled prenuptial agreements as, as part of them. And uh, I think the, the, the single biggest lobby group for uh, prenuptial agreements in Ireland is the Irish Creamery Managers Association and the IFA, because farmers are hugely in favour of it and have been for a very long time. And we're obviously very anti-divorce, uh, primarily linked to the family farm. But in 2006, 2007, Inga Klisman, who's a, a well-known uh, senior counsel family lawyer, was appointed by the government to head a working group to look into the possibility of prenuptial agreements and whether they were a good idea or not. And they made a number of recommendations that they could come in to law and they, they probably should come into law, uh, but provided there were a number of basic safeguards attached to them. And um, one of them was that the, the prenuptial agreement wouldn't be done immediately before the marriage, that there was a number of weeks uh, before the marriage and a variety of other good safeguards. But the government, that, that report is one of many hundreds of reports that sits on a shelf somewhere in a, in, in a department that hasn't been read again. So also the Law Society published a, a report from the Family Law Committee uh, and Jeff Shannon was, was the author and it was uh, contributed to also by the committee. And in that report, I think the, the Law Society came out and unambiguously backed prenuptial agreements because they would provide certainty on one level. However, I suppose my own personal view on prenuptial agreements is that they disadvantage the weaker or uh, less w wealthy spouse. I, I personally, I, I would do them, but I, I, I do think they, as, as a policy, if you like, a political point, I, I'd be against them because I think they disadvantage the person who is less wealthy. And um, I'm not sure do they really fit in with the, um, the sentiment in the Constitution and with the Irish view of marriage. Um, uh, they are popular in, in, in the UK, and there's a famous Rademacher case which, which enforced um, them and, and said how important they are, but they, they can be, uh, they can result in injustice. However, on balance, I suppose the kind of society we live on, people live in, people want, may want to contract out. And it's funny that cohabitants get rights. That's people who aren't married but live together for two years if they have a child or five years if they don't have a child. You can contract out of being a cohabitant by, by signing a, a kind of cohabitant uh, prenuptial agreement, but you can't do it for marriage. So I suppose all in all, while I'm against it, I could see why it might be brought in. I, I'm surprised it isn't a, a political issue um, more than it is, but it seems to be only family lawyers and farmers who are interested in it, maybe. Um, we kind of spoke at the start, Keith, about uh, the court process during the COVID-19, in particular to child protection. Uh, did you notice a rise in any child protection issues and uh, what kind of issues or what stage does a solicitor uh, get brought into a, a family law incident? Um, it, I suppose it depends on, on the situation um, uh, and it depends on the level of wealth of, of, of the client. Uh, g generally, um, a huge amount of domestic violence in Dublin, certainly people just go directly into Dolphin House and then come to you. Uh, that would be your kind of uh, normal client, if you like. But then you go maybe slightly more middle class or, or, or wealthier. And, and those clients won't go into Dolphin House with that, without a lawyer. And uh, they, they won't do anything without getting a solicitor. Normally, it's not that client who, who contacts you. It's a, a family friend or father or brother or Sorry, somebody. What exactly is Dolphin House? Sorry. Sorry, Dolphin House is the district family court for all of Dublin. So it does the entire Dublin metropolitan area. Um, so it, it would do a huge amount of work. It will be hugely busy. And there'll be four judges sitting there, even at the moment, more or less constantly. It, it has a kind of system of processing um, and domestic violence access maintenance and all essentially non-marital and domestic violence cases. It also has a mediation service, which is very useful, not appropriately for domestic violence, but it's very good, we say, for child access. And that's something I didn't mention about child access, that often mediation is really good for working out issues with uh, child access and also is, is very good uh, generally for a lot of family law um, issues where, where they can be teased out and provided people know what, what the range of what they should be looking for is. Um, so in, in, in terms of um, during COVID-19 and, and issues, um, I got some of the statistics from Dolphin House about, about three weeks ago. And while there hasn't been an increase in the figures uh, year on year, they're actually the same. Uh, now that when we analyzed them with a discussion with someone in the court service about it, and what they, they came to the conclusion, which I, I agree with, is that um, because people are in lockdown, there's a huge issue with getting out of the house and getting into Dolphin House. The upsurge generally for domestic violence cases uh, in Dublin 
and in most courts comes when the children go back to school after Christmas. It doesn't come during the Christmas season, it comes when children go back to school. And at the minute, people are still a bit trapped in their houses. Uh, and I'm talking trapped more from the point of view of children, and there's no one else to mind the children. And if you're in that situation, people aren't going to go into Dolphin House with children because it, it, it isn't a particularly nice place, even with without children, but particularly with children. So there's a whole load of other things, I think, that are bubbling up waiting for the schools to go back and other things to get back to normal. And I think really it's only a number of months afterwards we're going to see, well, look, this is it. And also there are probably people putting up with unbearable situations because of the lockdown as well that we haven't heard of. But again, just to say that I think the Gardaí are getting very involved in this area where they've been criticised by uh, uh, various organisations previously, but they do seem to be because they now have the time and the resources to, to maybe um, to put to it a COVID-19. Uh, Keith, um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, what's the plans for the future for yourself, for your own practice and for your own personally? Well, just to keep going, I think really. It might, it might have been different before COVID, but I, I think now it's just look, keep going, keep enjoying it, keep doing it, and um, I, I keep keep getting up every morning and going in, and uh, I, I think that's as much as you can do at the minute. Yeah, and you spoke at the start, there's some advice to young solicitors you said not to specify. Would you recommend law as a career? Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I usually enjoy it. I mean, it, it, it also gives you so much variety. I, I mean, if, if you want to, you can also teach if, if you want to get involved with the Law Society or diplomas or, or anything else. Um, you, you can also get involved in NGOs. Uh, you, you, you can get involved in, in the advocacy side. You can you know, get involved in the business management side of it. There's so much that once you're in and you're doing it and, and you like doing it, um, and, and also, I, I mean, the other advice I'd give is get involved in, in your local bar association or in the law society if you can at all. It really, if, 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 you, if you can put up with the, the, the meetings and the other bad stuff, it really, you get so much more out of it and, and to get on with your colleagues. And that, that really is, is, is a huge thing, certainly for me uh, in, my, in my career. It's, it's, I've got so much more out of all of that than, than I'd ever have. Of thought possible, and also it gives you great enjoyment and a bit of crack. And, yeah, you know, we all need a bit of crack, you know. Indeed, <laughs> we do. Listen, Keith, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really interesting conversation, and we wish you all the best for the future. And thanks, David. Thank Same you.